Welcome back. Welcome back. An American charity which pays drug addicts to be sterilized is drawing worldwide controversy, understandably. The charity, Project Prevention, has stopped more than 3,000 drink and drug addicts from having children by paying them to have contraception and, in some cases, full sterilization. And I'm joined now from Charlotte in North Carolina by Barbara Harris, who set up Project Prevention. And with me here is Neve Eastwood, a British charity worker who helps drug addicts here. Barbara, starting with you first, um, why and how did you seize on this way of dealing with these needy, crisis-ridden women? My husband and I became foster parents in 1989, and the first child that was placed with us was an eight-month-old baby girl who had been in foster care since birth, and the foster home didn't want her anymore, so we took her in. And we found out when we brought her home that she was the fifth baby born to a Los Angeles drug addict. Four months later, we got a phone call from the social worker saying the mother had given birth to her sixth baby, a baby boy, did we want him? And we brought him in our home so they could be together because the four older siblings were in four different homes. And the next year, we got a phone call saying the mother had given birth to her seventh baby, a baby girl, and did we want her? And we brought her home as well. And another phone call the following year saying the mother had given birth her eighth time to another baby boy, and did we want him? So we brought all four of them into our home and eventually adopted them. And during that entire process, I watched my children withdraw from drugs when they were born, um, suffering for months sometimes. They couldn't keep food down. The light bothered them. Noise bothered them. Uh, I was very angry, and I was very upset. At, in the beginning, I was upset at the birth mother, but then I became uh, upset with the system that allows these women to drop off damaged babies every year at the hospital and walk away with no consequences. Everybody was complaining. Social workers were complaining. Judges were complaining. Everybody, foster parents were complaining about the problem, but nobody was doing anything to stop it. So I decided to start paying irresponsible people to be responsible and use long-term birth control. Neve, what was your reaction to hearing <laughs> what, what Barbara does? Well, I think, first of all, you, mean, you have to admire Barbara for bringing these kids in and, and you know, providing foster care for them. I mean, that's a, an, an admirable thing. Um, and her personal story is very persuasive. But the reality is that this policy of providing very vulnerable people payment to make decisions around um, long-term contraception and sterilization. And I'd just like to mention, Barbara says the majority um, don't choose sterilization, but an over a third of the people accessing project prevention do choose sterilization, and they're women. Um, and really, what we need to question is whether this is the policy we want to apply to vulnerable people. Um, someone should have an inalienable right over their own reproductive and sexual choices. We shouldn't be manipulating the situation to say that they don't have a right to have children. Um, I think that's just simply wrong. All right, let me put that back to, to Barbara. In that situation, do you, do you think you're pressing a decision on a figure, a person, a victim, if you like to call it, but a person, pressing a decision that is too much to ask of that person who can't cope with that amount of freedom and that amount of compulsion in their youth. Do you, do you think you're putting extra pressure on people while trying to help them? Absolutely not. Everything that she said is actually supporting what I'm doing. Because if you can't trust them with a the decision, how can you trust them with a the child? What about the rights of the child? She never mentioned the rights of the children. It's always about the right of the mother, the right of the mother to procreate. What about the right of the children that she gives birth to? The last 20 women that we paid to have a tubal ligation had 120 pregnancies between them. 20 women had 120 pregnancies. They aborted 20 of, 24 of those. Six of those were stillborn. Four of them died from complications after birth. And 78 of their children remain, remain in foster care. That's my argument back to what she says. What about the children? All right. Well, thank you for that. Let me put that back to you. That very basic question there from Barbara, you've been talking, you've been talking about the parents and all of that. What about the rights of the young children? 
I, I think Barbara brings up a fair point, and I think we have to look at what this policy does to the rights of children. We're basically saying to children who are born in this situation that they're not worthwhile. Spokespeople for her organization have described them as pre-doomed, and yet her four children have, have turned out very well. I mean, it, it's the idea that we dictate the, the potential for life, you know, the, the, the hopefulness that is associated with, with a, a newborn child. I mean, there's so, so much that's wrong with what's said by this project. Um, the reality of um, the description around children who are born to crack mothers with um, withdrawal symptoms, actually the, the, the research, the evidence says that the um, withdrawal is not that serious and I'm not suggesting for a second that we should be encouraging people to have children in this situation and it's not um, a, a, a problem um, but also to the long-term impact of being exposed to cocaine in the womb is negligible. The evidence has shown, the scientific evidence has shown that these children grow up with the same um, expectations as their peers, the same capabilities as their peers. What do you say in answer to what we've just heard? Uh, I disagree with most of what was said. I know for a fact that children withdraw from drugs because I watched my children do it. And for anybody to say that they don't, they obviously haven't adopted and taken in a child. These children, yes, some of these children are fortunate enough to overcome their prenatal neglect and the drug use and go on to live somewhat of a normal life. My children are doing well because they were adopted by us and loved and nurtured their entire life. That's not what happens to most of these children. They end up in foster care, moving from home to home, and at age 18, 50 percent of foster kids here in the United States become homeless. It's a bigger picture than just the fact that irresponsible pe people shouldn't conceive children. It's what happens to the children after the fact. And just because a few like the ones I have are okay. That doesn't make it okay for these women to continue to give birth to children they're not able to care for, that they're going to put on society and let somebody else care for. I mean, what about the children? Everything that she's mentioning is about the women, and she's basically saying that it's okay to use crack because the kids might come out okay. Um, I just don't understand where she's coming from. Well, <laughs> where are you coming from? Absolutely simple. I'm not saying that people should use crack and be pregnant. I, that's not what I'm saying. I am saying that the project targets specific groups. It is much more linked to poverty. This is a much more complicated situation. And that's not being addressed. Mm -hmm. We need to be addressing health care. We need to be addressing access to drug treatment. We need to be giving people hope, not making judgments on them. We need to stop calling them irresponsible people. These are people with health problems. These are people who are mothers, they are sisters, they are brothers. You know, Barbara Harris personalizes this story. These, these women are irresponsible. That is what I am calling them. They're acting irresponsible, and I would only hope that if I were a drug addict, strung out on drugs, having a baby every year, that the system was taken away from me, that somebody would step in and say, you can't behave like this, and make me do anything it took to prevent me from having another child. I speak to these women all the time, and this week I spent an hour on the phone with a woman who called me crying because she had a baby. She was actually in the process of turning a trick when she had her baby. She didn't know she was pregnant and the head started crowning. She had to go to the hospital, not before she lit up her crack pipe, she told me, and she delivered a three pound baby. And she cried talking about how her children are going to be destroyed and, de and messed up for life because of her drug abuse. Now she has to live with that the rest of her life and it was preventable. It could have been prevented had she been on birth control and she is getting on birth control and she said thank God for project prevention. Well, there we have it. We need to give people hope, not take away hope. Everyone's seeking for hope, of course, and we'll return to this subject now, thanks to Neve and to Barbara. We thank you both very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, David. On Sunday, after 11 hours of talks, EU authorities announced that a stabilization fund had been agreed between EU finance ministers, central bankers, and the International Monetary Fund to prevent a Greek meltdown. The fund consists of 60 billion euros of support financed by EU bonds and 440 billion euros of loan guarantees from the euro area. That sum would be supplemented by a further 220 billion euro or more from the IMF. This is the biggest bailout since, well, the last biggest one was the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008. But will it be enough to solve this crisis and stop it from spreading to other Euro members.
Well, joining me now from Singapore is our investment guru and the world's Jim Rogers, founder of the Rogers International Commodity Index. He's here with us now, and let me ask you straight away, what does this new plan mean, short-term, medium-term, long-term, to the euro? Well, David, I was startled. Not, nay, I was stunned when I read that because this is a signal to me that they're giving up on the euro. They don't care whether the euro is a sound currency or not. They're saying to the member states, spend the money. Somebody will bail you out. Run up big debts. Don't worry. Everything will be okay. As far as I'm concerned, it's more corrosion of the, of the euro from within. Corrosion from within. What should they have done? Well, if I were doing it, I would have let Greece go bankrupt. Uh, Greece is 2% of the European economy. It would have been painful for the Greeks and for a few people for a while, but it wouldn't have been the end of the world. Then the Greeks would have realized, well, we've got to shape up. We've got to solve our problems. More importantly, all the other countries in Europe would have realized, well, we've got, we got to shape up, too. We have to solve our economic problems. We cannot keep, continue to spend money we don't have. We cannot continue to float bonds to people, to suckers, uh, so that we'll, we don't have to worry about our future. No, I would have let them go bankrupt. It would have been a difficult year or two, or maybe more for the Greeks, but the rest of the world would have been better off. And in terms of when that situation happens, if it ever did happen, what exactly happens to everybody? If Greece went bankrupt, what would happen to its companies? What would happen to its banks? What would happen to its individuals who's got some cash in the bank and so on? Does everybody lose everything? No, no, no. Very little would have happened to the individuals. Very little would have happened to the companies. Everybody would have continued. Uh, the Greek government would have had to cut back on its spending dramatically. Some parts of the Greek economy would perhaps have suffered. I mean, if you're doing business with the Greek government, the Greek government has to cut back. Obviously, you're going to suffer for a while. But people have been living high on the hog in, in Greece for years, as you know, David, and those people would have had to cut back. Other people would have been better off because they would have realized, oh, Okay, now our costs are coming down and we'll be able to do better things. Some bankers would have lost money. The reason that they did what they did, the bankers called up uh, the, the politicians and said, save us, save us. We own a lot of Greek bonds. That's not the way it's supposed to work, David. When people go bankrupt, they're supposed to go bankrupt. This is, David, this is welfare for the rich. This is socialism for the rich. Right, and the, what are the risks for Greece now? for accepting this plan, and what, what would have been the, the risks for Greece if they hadn't accepted the plan? Well, if they hadn't accepted the plan, they would have been forced to, to go bankrupt because nobody would, would help them pay their bills. They would have had to reorganize. David, countries have been going bankrupt for a few thousand years. There's nothing new about this. It happens not all the time, but it happens with, with some regularity. Countries reorganize. They go to their, their creditors. They say, we can only pay you so much. The creditors suffer. It was the banks who they would, they would go to who own their bonds. They would suffer, but then Greece would reorganize and start over. What's going to happen now, David, is three years from now, five years from now, eight years from now, as these debts get bigger and bigger, and it's not just Greece, it's other countries in Europe too, then you have the demise of the euro because the debts get so big that at some point people just say, we're not going to give you any more money. This ensures that that day is going to come. Jim, thank you very much for your update on the world situation. We'll be back to you again in a few weeks' time. Thanks for everything. And that'll, that's all I'm afraid we've got time for this week. Uh, doesn't time fly when you're enjoying it? Uh, join me again in seven days' time for another Frost Over the World. <laughs>